One of the biggest conundrums you're going to find when you start your clinical, practicum, as well as professional practice are the different nutritional diet breakdowns. In this video, we're going to be discussing what those nutritional diet breakdowns are and what you need to know when you start to practice. Let's get started. One of the common diets that you're going to hear is an MPO diet. What exactly does that mean? Well, it's defined as nothing by mouth. That means that we are withholding foods and liquids. An indication as why a patient would be on this diet is if they are going for procedures such as surgery, an EGD, as well as a colonoscopy. If they are having issues swallowing, they would be on an NPO diet. If the patient is at an increased risk of aspiration, that means part of their meals or their liquid is going to go into their lungs instead of their esophagus. Or if there is some kind of gastrointestinal compromise, such as with pancreatitis. So when it comes to nursing considerations, patients may be allowed to have small sips of water with medication if the physician has ordered it. You, make, you really want to make sure that you get feedback from the provider on what medications need to be provided when the patient is NPO if they don't have any difficulty swallowing, so that way we're not giving them something that they necessarily don't need. Patients must be given nutrition in some form. We can't leave a patient and be NPO forever, right? So we either place an NG tube, which is a tube that goes into the nose, down the esophagus, into the stomach, or the patient has a peg tube placed if the patient is gonna be NPO for an extended period of time. Traditionally, when a patient is on an NPO diet, we transition them into a clear liquid diet afterwards. And that consists of clear liquids that are easily digested and leave no undigested residue in the intestinal tract. So some clear liquid approved items are water, coffee without the cream, fruit juices, clear fruit flavored drinks, carbonated drinks or teas, gelatin, clear fat-free broth or bouillon, as well as an ice pop. So many times why patients are on this is it helps prevent um, dehydration by providing fluid and electrolytes. It's used as the initial feeding after a complete bowel rest like we see with our uh, pancreatitis patients. It's usually initiated to feed malnutrition persons or persons with no oral intake for some time. Uh, we use it for bowel preparation for surgery or diagnostic tests and post-operatively with fever, vomiting, as well as diarrhea. And it also can be used in patients with gastroenteritis. Something that's important for you to know as a nurse is that deficit because of this particular diet is going to be deficient in energy as well as many nutrients. It is going to be easily digestible, absorbed, and it's going to leave that minimal residue in our gastrointestinal tract. It is a short-term transition diet. We don't leave these patients on this diet for very long. It is limiting caffeine intake to help prevent upset stomach as well as sleeplessness. So while caffeine is something that we can give to the patient, we really want to make sure that we're limiting it. Salt and sugar are still acceptable when it comes to this diet. And lastly, dairy products and fruit juices with pulp are not considered clear liquids when it comes to this diet. Next, we can transition our patient into a full liquid diet. And that consists of fluids and foods that are normally liquid and turn to liquid at room temperature. So full liquid approved items include strained creamy soups, teas and juice, jello, milkshakes, pudding, popsicles, as well as yogurt. An indication of why a patient would be on this diet includes that it's a transition after that clear liquids following surgery, or it's a transition for patients who have difficulty chewing, swallowing, or tolerating solid foods. So nursing considerations for this diet include that, again, it's going to be deficient in energy as well as many nutrients. You want to use a complete nutritional liquid supplement as often as possible to meet the nutritional needs of the patient on a full liquid diet if they are on it for more than three days. And lastly, diets allow for dairy, which contains protein and fat. So like we talked about before in clear liquids, you can have dairy, but with our full liquid, it does allow for those dairy products which contain protein and fat, which will help kind of ease that nutritional deficit that we saw in clear liquid diets that we're gonna to continue to see, but not as much in full liquid diets. 
Now we're gonna transition away from our liquid diets and start looking into our mechanical soft and regular soft diets. We're gonna actually start putting food in these patients, right? So the definition includes foods that are allowed to be made easier to chew, swallow by using machines to either blend, puree, ground, or finely chop. It does not restrict fat, fiber, spices, or seasoning with these diets. So mechanical soft approved items include cottage cheese, sauce sliced cheese, ground meats, baked fish, eggs, soft vegetables, as well as applesauce. So what are some indications as why our patients need to be on this particular diet? So it's used for patients with difficulty chewing that can tolerate a more variety of texture than the liquid diet offers. It can be used for patients that have dental problems, surgery of the head or neck, patients that have difficulty swallowing, make sure that you have some kind of speech evaluation before we progress these patients to this diet because they may require thickened liquids depending on how severe that difficulty swallowing is. Something that's important to know that if we have a patient that is on thickened liquids, you can never ever add ice to thicken liquids because now you are taking away the thickness of that liquid. So I know some patients are gonna ask for ice because the liquid is not cold enough. Unfortunately, we cannot add ice to this because they will be placed at an increased risk of developing aspiration pneumonia. Nursing considerations when it comes to this diet is that these foods include part of the clear and fluid, um, full liquid diets with the additional of that mechanical soft approved food diet. So they can have their clear or full liquids as well as this mechanical soft diet as well. Foods that you're going to want to avoid with this diet include nuts, dried fruits, raw fruits, as well as vegetables, fried food, tufted, smoked, or salted meats, uh, no jerky, nothing like that, and foods with coarse textures. We don't want anything like that in this diet. Soft diets consist of the same foods, but they don't require that the food has to be blended, pureed, ground, and finely chopped. So when it comes to mechanical sauce, I'm mechan sorry, mechanical soft, they have to be blended, pureed, ground, and finely chopped. When it comes to regular soft, it doesn't require those um, additional steps to occur. Next, let's start getting into those more restricted diets. We're gonna begin by looking at our low fiber, low residue diet. So the definition of this is a restriction of food with fibers such as fruits, vegetables, and grains. We really want to limit the amount of undigested material passing through that large intestine, thus lessening bulky stools. So when it comes to low fiber diets that are not approved in this, you don't want to give the patient nuts, seeds, dried fruit, and coconut, whole grains, popcorn, and wheat germ, brown rice, wild rice, oatmeal, granola, shredded wheat, quinoa, um, as well as barley are not approved, dried baked beans, lima beans, peas, and lentils, chunky peanut butter, and many fruits and vegetables except bananas, melons, applesauce, as well as canned peaches. So why would a patient be on this diet? Well, foods that are le least likely to form an obstruction when the intestinal tract is narrow due to inflammation and scarring include these low fiber, low residue diets. We don't want those bulky stools. Um, additional reasons could be the patient has inflammatory bowel disease, a partial obstruction, gastroenteritis, diarrhea, as well as other gastrointestinal disorders. So something that's important to note when it comes to your nursing considerations is we really wanna look at foods um, that have low fiber, and those usually consist of white bread, um, fine cooked cereals, cooked potatoes without skins, white rice, as well as refined pastas, and dairy products should be limited to at least two servings a day for this particular diet. So we just talked about low fiber, low residue, now let's look at high fiber, high residue diets. So the definition of this diet is a diet that meets or exceeds the dietary reference intake for dietary fiber. So again, everything that we talked about before that you would want to avoid is now approved with this high fiber diet. And indications as to why we would 
provide this diet to our patients is it's used for constipation, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, the primary symptoms are either diarrhea or constipation, as well as asymptomatic diverticular disease. When it comes to nursing considerations, that high fiber provides between 20 to 35 grams of dietary fiber daily. Volume and weight are added to stool, speeding up the movement of that undigested material. Increased fiber gradually provides adequate fluids to reduce undesirable side effects such as abdominal cramps, bloating, diarrhea, and dehydration. And lastly, gas-forming foods for this particular diet should be avoided. So anything including apples, artichokes, barley, beans, um, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, celery, figs, melons, milk, molasses, nuts, uh, onions, radishes, soybeans, wheat, and yeast should be avoided when it comes to our high-fiber, high-residue diet. Next, let's talk about our fat-restricted diets when it comes to a lot of our gastrointestinal disorders. The definition is, is it really limits the amount of fat that a patient can intake to 50 grams per day. So what are some fat-restricted approved items? Well, we can give the patient lean meats, whole grain breads, fresh, frozen, or canned veggies or fruits, fat-free or low-fat dairy products, beans, legumes, egg whites, we want to limit, it, limit that to three times per week, fat-free uh, soups, coffee, teas, juice, as well as water. So indications as why someone would be on a fat-restricted diet include the reduction of symptoms such as abdominal pain, satyria, flatulence, and diarrhea associated with those high intake of dietary fats. It's also used for patients that have malabsorption disorders, pancreatitis, gallbladder disease, as well as gastroesophageal reflux, also known as GERD. Nursing considerations when it comes to this diet is the restriction of the total amount of fat also include saturated, trans fat, polyunsaturated, and monounsaturated fats. Patients with malabsorption may have difficulty tolerating fiber and lactulose. Uh, vitamins and mineral deficiencies may occur in patients with diarrhea and satyria. And then lastly, a fecal test may be ordered for fat malabsorption with excretion of more than 6 to 8 grams of fat per day during the three days of the specimen collection. Another diet you're going to see a lot is high calorie, high protein diet. So this is a meal plan with extra calories and proteins for health conditions that require these dietary foods. So certain approved items include hot cereals with milk, added fat and sugar, croissants, buttermilk biscuits, muffins, vegetables with margarine, butter or cream cheese, avocado, meats, eggs, dried fruit and lentils, peanut butter and tofu, Eggno um, eggnog and milkshakes if it is the Christmas time, as well as whole milk. So an indication as to why somebody would be on a high calorie, high protein diet includes patients with severe stress, um, severe stress, burns, wound healing, dialysis is a big one, cancer, human Im uh, immunodeficiency virus, also known as HIV, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, also known as AIDS, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, respiratory failure, or any other debilitating disease. So it's really patients that are going to be either restricted from food because of either being sick or ill, or any kind of debilitating disease that would require them to have these high calorie, high protein diets. So something that you need to know when it comes to nursing considerations is you really want to encourage snacks between meals, such as milkshakes, instant breakfast, as well as nutritional supplements to help maintain these high calorie, high pro protein diets. So carbohydrate consistent diets really are used for our diabetic patients because it helps patients with diabetes keep their carb consumption at a steady level through every meal and snack. This also helps prevent those blood sugar spikes and falls that we see with a lot of our diabetic patients. So anybody that has diabetes, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, and obesity will benefit from this particular diet. 
When it comes to nursing considerations, you really want to use that exchange system groups of foods according to the amount of carbs, fats, and proteins that they contain. Major food groups include carbs, meat, and meat substitute products, as well as fat groups. So a menu example of this diet for breakfast would include one cup of oatmeal, one slice of thin whole wheat toast with two tablespoons of peanut butter, coffee with unsweetened half and half. Their morning snack could consist of a fresh orange or an unsweetened iced tea. For lunch, they can have half a chicken breast, half cooked, whole, um, half cooked wheat berries, three cups of spinach, one cup of strawberry halves, one ounce of toasted walnuts, balsamic vinaigrette, and one dinner roll with unsweetened iced tea. For their afternoon snack, they can have four cups of air popped popcorn. And then for dinner, they can have a salmon filet with half a um, mashed sweet potato, one cup of steamed broccoli, one dinner roll, water, and one cup of raspberries. So another diet that you're going to see a lot of is the sodium restricted diet because it limits the amount of sodium foods and beverages for certain conditions, such as hypertension, heart failure, renal failure, cardiac disease, as well as liver disease. So depending on how restricted the diet is, if it is a no added salt diet, they can have four grams of sodium daily. For a moderate restriction, it is two to three grams of sodium daily. For strict restriction, it is one gram of sodium daily. And for severe restrictions, and again, these are very seldomly prescribed when it is a severe restriction, they can only have 500 milligrams of sodium daily. So sodium foods that we need to avoid include our canned, frozen, instant, smoked, pickled, and boxed foods because they contain a large amount of sodium. And then lunch meats, soy sauce, salad dressings, fast food, soups, and snacks, such as potato chips, as well as pretzels should also be avoided. When it comes to our nursing considerations, we need to know that certain medications contain a significant amount of salt. That's like our sodium hydrochloride, potassium, calcium, uh, I aspirin as well as our ibuprofen. So we really have to monitor if we have a sodium restricted diet, how much sodium is located in those medications. And then lastly, salt substitute um, options may be used to improve like palatability of certain foods. But it's also important to note that salt substitutes contain large amounts of potassium. So they should not be used when we have renal patients present because it can ultimately affect um, how those patients uh, respond to these salt substitutes. Protein restricted diets you will see when it comes to our renal disease and end stage liver disease patients because it really limits the protein uh, foods for certain disease processes. The nutritional status of critically ill patients when it comes to protein um, losing renal dialysis, malabsorption syndrome, as well as continuous renal replacement therapy such as CRRT, which we do a lot in the ICU, and dialysis should have protein limited diets. So protein restricted foods that we need to avoid are hot cereals with milk, added fat, and sugar croissants, buttermilk biscuits, muffins, vegetables with margarine, butter, cream cheese, avocados, meats, eggs, dried beans, as well as lentils, peanut butter and tofu, eggnog and milkshakes, and whole milk. So nursing considerations when it comes to protein restricted diets, we wanna provide enough protein to maintain nutritional status, but not an amount that will allow buildup of waste products from protein metabolism. So that's usually between 40 to 60 grams of protein daily. Special low protein products such as pasta, bread, cookies, wafers, and gelatin can help improve energy intake and add variety to these patients' diets, and carbohydrates can provide additional energy when we're severely restricting those protein diets. And the last diet that we're gonna discuss is the vegan and vegetarian diet. It's my personal favorite because I am a vegetarian. So vegan is defined as they follow a very strict vegan diet, which means they consume no animal products. Lacto-vegetarians mean they eat milk, cheese, dairy foods, but they avoid meat, fish, poultry, and eggs. 
Lacto-ovo vegetarians are, um, they eat dairy products and eggs without animal meats. And ovo vegetarian, only animal products consumed um, particularly are eggs. So when it comes to nursing considerations for the vegan and vegetarian diet is it's not usually prescribed as the diet of choice for patients um, because we need to ensure the patient eats enough energy as well as nutrients. So education needs to be provided on the consumption of proteins to ensure that we have an appropriate amount of essential amino acid intake. So protein deficiencies in vegetarian diets include energy, uh, protein, vitamin B12, zinc, calcium, omega-3 fatty acids, as well as vitamin D. So really they should consume more iron and vitamin C to get those nutrients that they're lacking in these particular diets. I hope that this video is helpful for you in understanding nutritional diet breakdowns. If you have any additional questions regarding nutritional diets, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe here on YouTube and make sure you hit that bell notification to be informed every time I post new videos. Head over to nursechung.com where there's additional resources to help you pass your skills exams as well as your NCLEX. But until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I will see you all again soon. Bye.